The lady patroness of Michaelis, the ticket of leave apostle of humanitarian hopes, was one of the most influential and distinguished connections of the assistant commissioner's wife, whom she called Annie, and treated still rather as a not very wise and utterly inexperienced young girl, but she had consented to accept him on a friendly footing, which was by no means the case with all of his wife's influential connections. Married young and splendidly at some remote epoch of the past, she had had, for a time, a close view of great affairs, and even of some great men. She herself was a great lady. Old now, in the number of her years, she had the sort of exceptional temperament which defies time with scornful disregard, as if it were a rather vulgar convention submitted to by the mass of inferior mankind. Many other conventions, easier to set aside, alas, failed to obtain her recognition, also on temperamental grounds, either because they bored her or else because they stood in the way of her scorns and sympathies. Admiration was a sentiment unknown to her. It was one of the secret griefs of her most noble husband against her. First, as always, more or less tainted with mediocrity, and next, as being in a way an admission of inferiority, and both were frankly inconceivable to her nature. To be fearlessly outspoken in her opinions came easily to her, since she judged solely from the standpoint of her social position. She was equally untrammeled in her actions, and as her tactfulness proceeded from genuine humanity, her bodily vigor remained remarkable, and her superiority was serene and cordial. Three generations had admired her infinitely, and the last she was likely to see had pronounced her a wonderful woman. Meantime, intelligent with a sort of lofty simplicity, and curious at heart, but not like many women, merely of social gossip, she amused her age by attracting within her ken, through the power of her great, almost historical, social prestige, everything that rose above the dead level of mankind, lawfully or unlawfully, by position, wit, audacity, fortune, or misfortune. Royal Highnesses, artists, men of science, young statesmen, and charlatans of all ages and conditions, who, unsubstantial and light, bobbing up like corks, show best the direction of the surface currents, had been welcomed in that house, listened to, penetrated, understood, appraised, for her own edification. In her own words, she liked to watch what the world was coming to, and as she had a practical mind, her judgment of men and things, though based on special prejudices, was seldom totally wrong, and almost never wrong-headed. Her drawing-room was probably the only place in the world where an assistant commissioner of police could meet a convict liberated on a ticket of leave on other than professional and official ground, who had brought Michaelis there one afternoon the assistant commissioner did not remember very well. He had a notion it must have been a certain member of parliament of illustrious parentage and unconventional sympathies, which were the standing joke of the comic papers. The notabilities, and even the simple notorieties of the day, brought each other freely to that temple of an old woman's 
not ignoble curiosity. You never could guess whom you were likely to come upon being received in semi-privacy within the faded blue silk and gilt frame screen, making a cozy nook for a couch and a few armchairs in the great drawing room with its hum of voices and the groups of people seated or standing in the light of six tall windows. Michaela's had been the object of a revulsion of popular sentiment, the same sentiment which years ago had applauded the ferocity of the life sentence passed upon him from complicity in a rather mad attempt to rescue some prisoners from a police van. The plan of the conspirators had been to shoot down the horses and overpower the escort. Unfortunately, one of the police constables got shot too. He left a wife and three small children, and the death of that man aroused through the length and breadth of a realm for whose defense, welfare, and glory men die every day as a matter of duty, an outburst of furious indignation, of a raging, implacable pity for the victim. Three ringleaders got hanged. Michaelis, young and slim, locksmith by trade, and great frequenter of evening schools, did not even know that anybody had been killed. His part, with a few others being to force open the door at the back of the special conveyance. When arrested, he had a bunch of skeleton keys in one pocket, a heavy chisel in another, and a short crowbar in his hand, neither more nor less than a burglar, but no burglar would have received such a heavy sentence. The death of the constable had made him miserable at heart, but the failure of the plot also. He did not conceal either of these sentiments from his empaneled countrymen, and that sort of compunction appeared shockingly imperfect to the crammed court. The judge on passing sentence commented feelingly upon the depravity and callousness of the young prisoner. That made the groundless fame of his condemnation. The fame of his release was made for him on no better grounds by people who wished to exploit the sentimental aspect of his imprisonment, either for purposes of their own or for no intelligible purpose. He let them do so in the innocence of his heart and the simplicity of his mind. Nothing that happened to him individually had any importance. He was like those saintly men whose personality is lost in the contemplation of their faith. His ideas were not in the nature of convictions. They were inaccessible to reasoning. They formed in all their contradictions and obscurities an invisible and humanitarian creed which he confessed rather than preached with an obstinate gentleness a smile of pacific assurance on his lips, and his candid blue eyes cast down because the sight of faces troubled his inspiration, developed in solitude. In that characteristic attitude, pathetic in his grotesque and incurable obesity, which he had to drag like a galley slave's bullet to the end of his days, the assistant commissioner of police beheld the ticket of leave apostle, filling a privileged armchair with the screen. He sat there by the head of the old lady's couch, mild-voiced and quiet, with no more self-consciousness than a very small child, and with something of a child's charm, the appealing charm of trustfulness confident of the future, whose secret ways had been revealed to him within the four walls of a well-known penitentiary. He had no reason to look with suspicion upon anybody. 
if he could not give the great and curious lady a very definite idea as to what the world was coming to, he had managed without effort to impress her by his unembittered faith, by the sterling quality of his optimism. A certain simplicity of thought is common to serene souls at both ends of the social scale. The great lady was simple in her own way. His views and beliefs had nothing in them to shock or startle her, since she judged them from the standpoint of her lofty position. Indeed, her sympathies were easily accessible to a man of that sort. She was not an exploiting capitalist herself. She was, as it were, above the play of economic conditions. And she had a great capacity of pity for the more obvious forms of common human miseries, precisely because she was such a complete stranger to them that she had to translate her conception into terms of mental suffering before she could grasp the notion of their cruelty. The assistant commissioner remembered very well the conversation between these two. He had listened in silence. It was something as exciting in a way, and even touching in its foredoomed futility, as the efforts at moral intercourse between the inhabitants of remote planets. But this grotesque incarnation of humanitarian passion appealed somehow to one's imagination. At last, Michaelis rose, and taking the great lady's extended hand, shook it, retained it for a moment in his great cushioned palm with unembarrassed friendliness, and turned upon the semi-private nook of the drawing-room, his back, vast and square, and as if distended under the short tweed jacket. Glancing about in serene benevolence, he waddled along to the distant door with the knots of other visitors. The murmur of conversations paused on his passage. He smiled innocently at a tall, brilliant girl whose eyes met his accidentally and went out unconscious of the glances following him across the room. Michaelis's first appearance in the world was a success, a success of esteem unmarred by a single murmur of derision. The Interrupted conversations were resumed in their proper tone, grave or light. Only a well-set-up, long-limbed, active-looking man of forty, talking with two ladies near a window, remarked aloud with an unexpected depth of feeling. Eighteen stone, I should say, and not five foot six. Poor fellow! It's terrible, terrible. The lady of the house, gazing absently at the assistant commissioner, left alone with her on the private side of the screen, seemed to be rearranging her mental impressions behind her thoughtful immobility of a handsome old face. Men with gray mustaches and full, healthy, vaguely smiling countenances approached, circling round the screen, two mature women with a matronly air of gracious resolution, a clean-shaved individual with sunken cheeks and dangling a gold-mounted eyeglass on a broad black ribbon with an old-world dandified effect. A silence deferential, but full of reserves, resigned for a moment, and then the great lady exclaimed, not with resentment, but with a sort of protesting indignation, and that officially is supposed to be a revolutionist. 
What nonsense! She looked hard at the assistant commissioner, who murmured apologetically, Not a dangerous one, perhaps. Not dangerous? I should think not indeed. He is a mere believer. It's the temperament of a saint, declared the great lady in a firm tone, and they kept him shut up for twenty years. One shudders at the stupidity of it, and now they have let him out. Everybody belonging to him is gone away somewhere, or dead. His parents are dead. The girl he was to marry has died while he was in prison. He has lost the skill necessary for his manual occupation. He told me all this himself with the sweetest patience. But then, he said, he had had plenty of time to think out things for himself. A pretty compensation. If that's the stuff revolutionists are made of, some of us may well go on their knees to them. She continued in a slightly bantering voice, while the banal society smiles hardened on the worldly faces turned towards her with conventional deference. The poor creature is obviously no longer in a position to take care of himself. Somebody will have to look after him a little. He should be recommended to a fellow a treatment of some sort. The soldierly voice of the active-looking man was heard advising from a distance. He was, in the pink, of condition for his age, and even the texture of his long frock coat had a character of elastic soundness, as if it were a living tissue. The man is virtually a cripple, he added, with unmistakable feeling. Other voices, as if glad of the opening, murmured hasty compassion. Quite startling, monstrous, most painful to see. The lank man with the eyeglass on a broad ribbon pronounced mincingly, the word grotesque, whose justness was appreciated by those standing near him. They smiled at each other. The assistant commissioner had expressed no opinion either then or later. His position make again impossible for him to ventilate any independent view of a ticket of leave convict. But in truth, he shared the view of his wife's friend and patron, that Michaelis was a humanitarian sentimentalist, a little mad, but upon the whole incapable of hurting a fly intentionally. So, when that name cropped up suddenly in this vexing bomb affair, he realized all the danger of it for the ticket-of-leave apostle, and his mind reverted at once to the old lady's well-established infatuation. Her arbitrary kindness would not brook patiently any interference with Michaelis's freedom. It was a deep, calm, convinced infatuation. She had not only felt him to be inoffensive, but she had said so, which was last by a confusion of her absolutist mind became sort of incontrovertible demonstration. It was as if the monstrosity of the man with his candid infant's eyes and a fat angelic smile had fascinated her. She had come to believe almost his theory of the future, since it was not repugnant to her prejudices. She disliked the new element of plutocracy in the social compound and industrialism as a method of human development appeared to her singularly repulsive in its mechanical and unfeeling character. The humanitarian hopes of the mild Michaelis tended not towards utter destruction but merely towards the complete economic ruin of the system, and she did not really see where was the moral harm of it. It would do away with all the multitude of the parvenus, 
whom she disliked and mistrusted, not because they had arrived anywhere, she denied that, but because of their profound unintelligence of the world, which was the primary cause of the crudity of their perceptions and the aridity of their hearts. With the annihilation of all capital, they would vanish too, but universal ruin, providing it was universal, as it was revealed to Michaelis, would leave the social values untouched. The disappearance of the last piece of money could not affect people of position. She could not conceive how it could affect her position, for instance. She had developed these discoveries to the assistant commissioner, with all the serene fearlessness of an old woman who had escaped the blight of indifference. He had made for himself the rule to receive everything of that sort in a silence which he took care from policy and inclination not to make offensive. He had an affection for the aged disciple of Michaelis, a complex sentimental depending a little on her prestige, on her personality, but most of all on the instinct of flattered gratitude. He felt himself really liked in her house. She was kindness personified, and she was practically wise, too. She made his married life much easier than it would have been without her generously full recognition of his rights as Annie's husband. Her influence upon his wife, a woman devoured by all sorts of small selfishnesses, small envies, small jealousies, was excellent. Unfortunately, both her kindness and her wisdom were of unreasonable complexion, distinctly feminine, and difficult to deal with. She remained a perfect woman all along her full tale of years, and not as some of them do become, a sort of slippery, pestilential old man in petticoats. And it was as of a woman that he thought of her, the specially chosen incarnation of the feminine, wherein is recruited the tender, ingenious, and fierce bodyguard for all sorts of men who talk under the influence of an emotion, true or fraudulent, for preachers, seers, prophets, or reformers. Appreciating the distinguished and good friend of his wife and himself in that way, the assistant commissioner became alarmed at the convict Michaelis's possible fate. Once arrested on suspicion of being in some way, however remote, a party to this outrage, the man could hardly escape being sent back to finish his sentence at least. And that would kill him. He would never come out alive. The assistant commissioner made a reflection extremely unbecoming his official position without being really creditable to his humanity. If the fellow is laid hold of again, he thought, she will never forgive me. The frankness of such a secretly outspoken thought could not go without some derisive self-criticism. No man engaged in a work he does not like can preserve many saving illusions about himself. The distaste, the absence of glamour, extended from the occupation to the personality. It is only when our appointed activities seem by a lucky accident to obey the particular earnestness of our temperament that we can taste the comfort of complete self-deception. The assistant commissioner did not like his work at home. The police work he had been engaged on in a distant part of the globe had the saving character of an irregular sort of warfare, or, at least, the risk and excitement 
of open-air sport. His real abilities, which were mainly of an administrative order, were combined with an adventurous disposition, chained to a desk in the thick of four millions of men, he considered himself the victim of an ironic fate, the same, no doubt, which had brought about his marriage with a woman exceptionally sensitive in the matter of colonial climate, besides other limitations, testifying to the delicacy of her nature and her tastes. Though he judged his alarm sardonically, he did not dismiss the improper thought from his mind. The instinct of self-preservation was strong within him. On the contrary, he repeated it mentally with profane emphasis and a fuller precision. Damn it! If that infernal heat has his way, that fellow will die in prison, smothered in his fat, and shall never forgive me. His black, narrow figure, with the white band of the collar under the silvery gleams on the close-cropped hair at the back of the head, remained motionless. The silence had lasted such a long time that Chief Inspector Heat ventured to clear his throat. This noise produced its effect. The zealous and intelligent officer was asked by a superior, whose back remained turned to him immovably, You connect Michaelis with this affair? Chief Inspector Heat was very positive, but cautious. Well, sir, he said, we have enough to go upon. A man like that has no business to be at large anyhow. You will want some conclusive evidence, came the observation and a murmur. Chief Inspector Heat raised his eyebrows at the black, narrow back, which remained obstinately presented to his intelligence and his zeal. There will be no difficulty in getting up sufficient evidence against him, he said, with virtuous complacency. You may trust me for that, sir, he added, quite unnecessarily, out of the fullness of his heart, for it seemed to him an excellent thing to have that man in hand, to be thrown down to the public, should it think fit to roar with any special indignation in this case. It was impossible to say yet whether it would roar or not. That, in the last instance, depended, of course, on the newspaper press. But in any case, Chief Inspector Heat, purveyor of prisons by trade and a man of legal instincts, did logically believe that incarceration was the proper fate for every declared enemy of the law. In the strength of that conviction, he committed a fault of tact. He allowed himself a little conceited laugh and repeated, Trust me for that, sir.